Well, hey friends, as we get started in this Advent season, uh, we're also starting a new series. Uh, it's going to take us from now until Christmas Eve. We're calling this series Just a Kid from Where. We're going to be looking at who really is Jesus. Right, we're kind of playing on this idea of you might be familiar with uh, the kid from Akron. Right? LeBron James, uh, even when he won a championship, he still talked about himself as being just a kid from Akron. And for those of us who are from this area, it was this kind of statement of pride that he never forgot uh, his origins. And so we're going to be looking at the origins of Jesus. Who really is this kid that Christmas is all about? Because the thing is, you don't have to be a Christian to have some idea about Christmas. Maybe you've seen Charlie Brown Christmas special and you've seen Linus uh, kind of walk bravely on stage and tell the Christmas story. Something about shepherds and angels and, and maybe you even think of wise men and sheep and, and it's really kind of cute. Right? Maybe you drive through the town and you see these scenes set up. But what's interesting is that in John's story of Jesus, in his gospel account of Jesus that we've been reading now for the past 12 weeks, in his story, he skips all of that. He skips all of that and goes even further back to say, who really is Jesus? Because you see, John wrote his story of Jesus last. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other three stories of Jesus, uh, they wrote them sooner than John. And so when John finally gets around to writing his story, there's been about a generation since Jesus was on earth. And already there are questions uh, being asked about who really was Jesus. Just like if you were to drive up to Highland Square or maybe walk around Akron Family Restaurant, and if you were to ask people, who is Jesus, you'd get a lot of different answers. You'd get some people who said Jesus was uh, this religious figure. Maybe some people would say he was kind of this mystical healer. Others might say he was a con man or, or maybe just kind of a, a figment of people's imagination. Those same kinds of questions, those same kind of answers were being raised at the time that John is writing his story about Jesus. And so when he tells us about Jesus, when he tells us where Jesus came from, he doesn't start on Christmas. He goes deeper than that. And so the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the first chapter of John's story of Jesus. Because who Jesus is and how you answer that question is so important. In fact, it's so important that John, when he finishes his letter, he tells us in John chapter 20 that he's written all of these things, all of these things about Jesus so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you might have life in his name. He says it's so important that you get Jesus right, that it is a matter of life and death. If you really see who Jesus is, it will change your life forever. And so we're going to be looking at the first chapter of John and who John tells us Jesus really is. And so this morning, we're going to be reading John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So if you have a Bible close by, uh, why don't you go ahead and pull it up with me. I'm going to be reading John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This is God's Word for us this morning. So John starts his story in the beginning, and he tells us about this Word. Now, he uses that Word a couple of times, this Word, and so you might wonder, what's he talking about? In fact, in a little while, he's going to tell us that this word that he's talking about is actually Jesus. That you could go back and read these verses like this. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. So John is making a bold claim. He's saying that that baby in the manger that Christmas is all about, that baby is more than just a baby. That baby is, in fact, God. And so as we look at John's bold claim here, I just want to ask three questions about what John is saying. The first question is this, which God? The second is this, uh, what is that God like? And third, what difference does it make? Which God, what is that God like, and what difference does it make? So let's answer the first question, which God? So if John says that Jesus is God, which God is he talking about? Is he just kind of adding Jesus to a shelf of gods? Is he saying, uh, add to your list of deities, Jesus is also in this mix? If you look at the first three words that John uses, he says, in the beginning. Now, he's not just kind of pulling uh, words that kind of shape how you start a story, like once upon a time or a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Jesus, I mean, John is, is very intentional here with his words. 
Because right, if you ever tried to read the Bible, chances are you start on page one. And on page one, the first three words are in the beginning. You see, John is drawing a straight line from Jesus, this Jesus who is God, to the God of Genesis 1. He's saying that Jesus, who is God, is the same God that is active in Genesis chapter 1. And if you look at what that God does, you see that that God is creative and powerful. In fact, that God is the only God. This is clear throughout the whole Old Testament that there's only one God, and that is the God that created in Genesis chapter 1. And if you read Genesis chapter 1, what you see is this God is so creative and powerful, in fact, that when this God creates, he doesn't create out of conflict. He doesn't kind of have to pull pieces together. He just creates by commanding things. And so with his words, he says, let there be light, and there's light. And with his words, he says, let there be life, and there is life. With his words, he says, let there be humanity, and there's humanity. And so when John says, in the beginning was the word, and this word is Jesus, what he is saying is that just like when God used his words to create, it's as if Jesus was right there with him. That as God commanded light to be made with his words, Jesus was the one who made it happen. As God uh, commanded that life be formed with his words, Jesus is the one who made this happen. See, John is saying Jesus is not a creation of God. It wasn't like God created Jesus first, that Jesus is in fact God himself with God in the beginning when he creates. Right? That is the God that Jesus is, this God who is also in the Old Testament creating everything with simply his words. And so let's ask the second question then. If that is the God that Jesus is, then what is that God like? You'll notice that John, as he says, Jesus is this God of the Old Testament, he uses two uh, seemingly contradictory statements. He says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Now that seems a little strange. Right? Like if I was to introduce myself to you and I said, Hi, I am John, and I am also with John. Uh, you would think that I have something maybe not right in my head, that I've got something I need to talk to somebody about. Like, it just doesn't seem to make sense. So what is John saying about Jesus? Is he God, or is he with God? You see, what John is putting words to is really what Jesus shows us about this God. You see, if you read through the Old Testament, what you'll find is it's clear that there is one God in the Old Testament. In fact, one of the most important verses of the Old Testament says there is one God and one God only in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so there is one God in the Old Testament, and yet uh, Jesus seems to also be that God. And in fact, if you read through the Old Testament, what you'll find is that one God seems to have uh, some multiple dimensions to him. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, you see that this God who creates also has a spirit that seems to move throughout creation. And then just a few verses later, when God creates humanity, he says, let us make man in our image. It seems that there seems to be one God and yet multiple dimensions to this God. And so what John is saying is he's putting words to this reality that God is one God in three persons. God is one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what Christians have throughout history called the Trinity. And now it's hard to describe who God really is. And if we could wrap our minds around it completely, then it would be too small to talk about God. But God is one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so when John says Jesus was God and also with God, he's saying that Jesus is fully and completely God. He has all the power and all the authority of God, and yet he also exists within this relationship known as the Trinity. God the Father loving God the Son, God the Son loving God the Spirit, and God the Spirit loving God the Father. This is what is true about God, and this is what Jesus shows us. As we get glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but now as Jesus comes to us and he teaches us about God, even as he talks about his father, we see this over and over again, is that Jesus always talks about God as his father, and he calls himself his son. He says, I am in the father, and the father is in me. This is what John says at the end of his letter. He says that you might believe that Jesus is the son of God, 
fully and completely God, and yet with God the Father. This is who God is, and this is what Jesus has come to show us. That God is one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now you might be wondering, what does that matter? Right? That seems like a really kind of dusty thing, right? That seems like something that people in uh, like higher education uh, argue about or people kind of uh, write in big, dense books and they stuff in the dark corners of libraries. Like, what is the point of that? And so let's talk about what difference it makes that God is three in one as Jesus reveals to us. You know, someone has said that the most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. The most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. I mean, think about it. If, if you believe that God doesn't exist, right, that changes a lot about how you live your life. It changes your basis for making decisions and what you decide is good and bad. It changes how you view uh, the reality of death and what comes after life. If you believe that God does exist, right, that changes uh, how you see yourself and where you see yourself in the world. See, the most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. And so if we're going to really understand who Jesus is and really understand what it means to place our hope in him, it's important that we understand what this God is really all about. And the fact that God is one God in three persons sets Christianity apart from any religion or any other worldview. See, other religions will say that there is one God and only one God, or they'll say there's lots of gods or everything is God, but Christianity says that God is one in three persons. And I want you to imagine for a second. I want you to imagine that there is one God and only one person. And kind of like a, a solo God. This is uh, sort of what Islam teaches, or even Judaism teaches, is that there is one God and only one God and one person. I want you to imagine that that God, that God is all-powerful. That God is able to create. Anything that that God created right, would be less than that God, which means that that God would be truly unable to love. I mean, think about it. If that God has always been and only ever been, right, that God has never known a relationship of equality. And God has never known uh, someone or something else that it could truly love as an equal. That God could try to create another God, but that God would still uh, be less than that God. That God could create humanity, but there's still this gap between that God and its creation. But you see, the fact that in the Bible we see that God is one God in three persons means that God has always and forever been a community of love. That since before the beginning of time, God has existed in this perfect community of love known as the Trinity. Even before God created, God was Father and God was Son. And this is, in fact, God's primary identity throughout the New Testament, is that God is a father and Jesus is his son. Which means that before he created, before anything else, God knew love. This is why John would later, in one of his letters, tell us that God is love. That at the heart of God, since before the beginning of time, is this love between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit which means that everything that he creates, even us, we are created to know relationships and to know love. You see, a God who exists in a relationship can create a world that is teeming with love and relationships. And that God who creates doesn't create because uh, that God is lonely. He doesn't create because he's bored. He doesn't create because he needs something. He creates to share this love. And you see, this is what Jesus comes to do. He comes to show us that love again, to remind us that at the heart of God is this love that we are created to know. I mean, this is why John says all things were made through him, and apart from him, nothing was made. What he's saying is, is you were created to know this God who is love. And Christmas is all about that God continuing to love us even when we have turned our backs on him continuing to love us even when we have ignored him. And Jesus is the clearest sign of that. That when God sends Jesus, he's not sending uh, an assistant. He's not sending uh, a messenger. He's sending himself to show us who he is and to invite us back into relationship with him. You see, if you're listening to this this morning, 
and you're not yet a Christian. This is what Christianity is really all about. It's about knowing this God who is in his very essence love. This God who is greater than we can imagine. This God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who has pursued us. Who is sharing that love and reaching that love out to us again so that we could be reunited with him. And this is why Jesus comes to us. This is why it matters that we believe that Jesus is fully God not just a second-hand messenger uh, or a stand-in, that he is God himself come to us, the same God who has existed since before the beginning of time. And to become a Christian, in fact, if you were to read the New Testament, what you find is, is the primary way that Christians are described in the New Testament. It's rarely this description of getting saved. Very rarely in the New Testament do they say, uh, to become a Christian, you have to be saved or get saved. In fact, the main way that Christians are described in the New Testament is with this phrase, in Christ. To be a Christian is to be in Christ. Which means this, that, that when God sends Jesus, who is fully God to us, he is sending him uh, to us to bring us back into his love. And to become a Christian is to trust that Jesus is God to receive what he is offering. And then it's like Jesus wraps his arms around us in an embrace, and he holds us tight. And all of the love that God the Father has for God the Son, that same love that he has had since before the beginning of time, is now available to us when we are in Christ, when we place our trust in him. You see, this is what God has done for us. He has sent not a messenger not a second-hand account. He has sent himself to us to wrap his arms around us so that all of the love that God the Father has for God the Son could be available to us when we place our trust in Jesus. And so may you know today, in the midst of this season of distance and loneliness, in the midst of this time where uh, we're not able to be with loved ones and where things are, are just difficult right now, may you know the love of God that is secure for you in Jesus. That God's love for you is extended to you, finding you right where you are. And that when you place your trust in Jesus, when you have embraced who he is, he embraces you back and all of the love that is at the heart of God is available to us. Let me pray for us. God, you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, this, uh, this mystery is profound and yet we see it most clearly in Jesus that he has come to tell us about you, to reveal to us who you really are, and that at, at your heart is love. That before the beginning of time, you existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you created us to know that love and to share in that love. So God, as we await Christmas, and as we remember what it means that Jesus has come to us, would we know that love this morning? Would you uh, extend that love into our hearts, into our minds as we consider who you are? And, And would we, in knowing you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be reminded that we can trust you no matter what life throws our way? God, you are love, and we see that most clearly in Jesus. And so as we find ourselves in him, would you transform our hearts and our minds to look more like him, and to love like him in this world that so desperately needs to know your love. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who is fully God. Amen.